and I want to introduce Julia Taylor Rise. Um, she is an elected fellow of Sirius and has published over 50 peer-reviewed papers on artificial intelligence, computational humor, computational semantics, fuzzy logic, and there's a whole list after that. Today she will present a talk titled Dissecting the Front, What We Can Learn from Computers Not Understanding Humor. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Julia Taylor Rise. Thank you very much. This is, I believe, the last talk on humor within Dawn or Doom. Um, I'm going to take a more um, Doom perspective, but for the computer as opposed to us humans. Um, this talk is going to be more of a scientific talk as opposed to taking a lot of artistic perspectives that the previous ones did. And uh, I typically say when I am talking about humor to a, an audience that is not familiar with humor studies, that humor studies conferences are the least humorous that you ever want to go to. So uh, please prepare for a talk that will be um, with, that will lack a lot of humor here. Um, I promise to give you a couple of jokes, but um, I don't know if you are familiar with Food Network when um, they cook and then they analyze everything, and you see that something is totally delicious, but from the comments of the judges, you wouldn't ever want to eat it. Yeah, um, welcome to Studies of Humor. <laughs> so, um, humor is rather multidisciplinary field from what you see over here. Pretty much any field that you can think of has a hand in analyzing humor. Most of the time we are going to be looking at linguistic sides of humor and um, psychological sides of humor. But realistically speaking, there are a lot of literary studies and a lot of neuroscience. We have to have neuroscience. I mean, we are here to understand how human mind processes humor in general. Um, there is some philosophy, some business as an application, um, a lot of anthropology, a lot of sociology. But again, for this talk, we are going to focus on psychology and linguistics. If you are looking at all of those fields, broadly, you can separate researchers in all of those fields into areas. Those that are interested in the essence of humor. What is it? Humor. What kind of animal is it? And then the other camp is, or another side of studying humor is, what does humor do to us people? How do we react to it? What do we like? What do we not like? and uh, whether we need it in general and when we need it. Um, both are truly valuable and considerably more research is being done in the second one than in the first, thus I will concentrate on the first, um, just so you have fun with it. Um, if you are looking at the essence of humor, you should be interested in what is humor, the very basic question, right? What is it? when something is funny, to whom it is funny, about what it is funny, in what particular situation and how it changes, and nobody knows an answer to all of these questions or even one of them, unfortunately. And um, if you want to have a computer that actually participates with you in the humor production or humor generation, it would be nice to have answers to these. Um, again, lots of research has been done on humor theories or humor uh, proposals for those theories. Um, according to some of the researchers, there is no humor theory yet because there is no necessary and sufficient condition that would predict all of those variables that would go into humor definition. But nevertheless, it is useful to take a look at at least some of them. Now, we are here for computational humor. And the real question is, do we need it? I mean, who cares? So we have a computer and it doesn't understand humor. What's the big deal? 
Well, it wasn't about 10 years ago. But right now, we are so connected to all of those devices, and we spend so much time on online, and we type so much, and we are being uh, um, looked into our behavior, data mining, and all of that stuff so much that it would be really nice that something out there would differentiate when we are serious and when we are not, wouldn't it? Um, moreover, if we have a computer that actually understands our sense of humor and can cater to our sense of humor, whatever that is for the time being, um, then perhaps it would create a more human-friendly environment. And since we have a lot more computers in our households, especially those that are being uh, looked at from the assistive devices, devices for disabled, the devices for children that have trouble learning language, um, um, you name it, uh, programs that help non-native speakers of whatever uh, language learn it a little bit better. Humor would be really good as a uh, friendly kind of interface, and you will see that some of the applications are already there. Um, it's not going to take over the world anytime soon. Um, why is that? Because in order to understand a joke, it has to have a lot of human knowledge. Take a look at the joke that is over here. How many brewers does it take to change a light bulb? One third less than for a regular bulb. What do you need to know in order to understand this joke? Past the fact that how many eggs does it take to change a light bulb typically results in a joke. But really to understand this joke, you need to connect the brewers. You need to know that there is light beer and regular beer. You need to know the calorie intake of light beer versus regular beer. You need to combine all of it together. And uh, you have to reason about it. I mean, this is not straightforward. How easy is it for a computer? Not really. Why is it not really easy for a computer? Well, let's assume that you are a computer for a minute. And you are reading this text. Most likely, every word of this text is known to you. Yet, it shouldn't make much sense. I mean, yes, you understand the sentences, but tying them together is practically impossible. Moreover, if by the time I am done talking to you about humor, I ask you what this is about, the odds are you will not remember much of it. Why? Because there is no anchoring point. There is no connecting device that takes all of those sentences and information in those sentences and puts them together, right? You read the text, all good. Now let's do this. There's your anchoring point. Now all of a sudden the text makes sense. Now all of a sudden you can appreciate what is there. It is not a joke. I mean, if you think it is funny, that's great, but it's not intended to be a joke. Um, and uh, once you see the picture, once you see how to connect the dots, once you see the knowledge that was not there, the information that was not there originally, you can understand what the text is about, you will remember it, you can reason about it. So the situation that computers are typically in is they see a lot of words and they see a lot of information, or rather a lot of data, with those words. But they have no anchoring points. They cannot tie it all together. And as you understand, when they cannot tie it all together, um, this is rather difficult. Now, joke number two. Another very simple joke. That is a cartoon, as you can see. This guy walked into a bar, and um, from the cartoon, you can see that he actually collapsed with the wall. 
which means that you activate the second meaning of walking into. Typically, if you hear somebody walked into a bar, you will assume that they physically moved to a restaurant. The collision sense is not there, most likely, until something triggers it, right? In this case, it's the cartoon that triggers it. Most of the time, there's going to be something else. The way the jokes work, if you are reading a text that is a joke, there will be some triggering mechanism, perhaps a punchline, typically it is a punchline, that reveals that second meaning. How difficult is it for a computer to see that second meaning? Well, at the very least, in this particular text, it needs to understand each and every meaning of each and every word and try to put it together according to world knowledge. It should then reject everything that is impossible according to its world knowledge or the anchoring mechanism, you know, that picture of the world that you see, and uh, accept those um, interpretations that are possible. In this case, walk into results in two meanings. One of them is going to be collision. The other one is going to be physical movement. Bar has two meanings. One of them is going to be a wall or, well, not a wall, but some sort of a pole, perhaps. And the second one is going to be a restaurant or a place where you buy drinks. You combine those together. You have two meanings. They create a joke. Is it simple for a computer to do? We are talking about natural language processing that can do pretty much everything, right? We have Watson that is winning Jeopardy. We have devices in our pockets that uh, can follow our commands and give us uh, information about restaurants. Um, we can go to Google and it will give us the answers about everything that we want to know about. Why is this so difficult? Well, two reasons. One is we are still after that essence of humor, what it is. We don't know what makes it funny, but there is a simpler reason. There are those interpretations that you have to get to, and there are at least two of them. And most of the time when you are looking normal NLP type stuff, you're interested in the first interpretation, the highest interpretation. Even if you generate a hundred more, it is absolutely not clear how far down you have to go to select that second interpretation that is going to result in humor. So that is going to be our second problem. Now, when we are talking about humor systems, we can look at various dimensions of what can be done. The first question that can be asked is, how much of a system ability needs to be there for it to produce humor? In other words, um, what's the percentage of effort that a computer has to do versus a percentage of effort that a human has to do for it to be truly computational humor, whatever that means? so that we can say that computer is participating in an event. And uh, from the time of when computational humor started, probably in the early 90s, um, 1992 probably is the first mention of it, up to now, um, the line of manual versus autonomous varies significantly, and most of the time we can be at either end and everything in between even now, even in 2016. The second dimension that we are looking at is detection versus generation. Can computer generate a joke, actually create a joke, versus can they understand the jokes that we are talking about, the ones that we generate? Um, most are equally difficult. They are difficult in their own right. From the generation point of view, you can rely on particular templates to generate a joke, but then you have to access world knowledge that is available to be relevant to that particular joke. 
But more importantly, you have to understand the structure of a joke that people will like. So uh, um, do I like jokes that are particularly lengthy? Or do I like jokes that just tap into the knowledge that I want? And I will make all the dots there. It's the computer that has to create that narrative that is going to be acceptable to a human being. And I'm not even talking about lexical choices and grammatical choices. Let's just assume that that is given that computer maybe, maybe can make. On the understanding aspects of it, um, you don't have to worry about the rhetoric. It's given to you. The joke is already there. The problem is that the situations that the joke is about, you are no longer choosing. You cannot say, I know the world of university, and thus I can make jokes about university. It's a human that is generating a joke, any joke, any world knowledge. And the computer has to understand about all of those situations to appreciate the joke or to say, hey, you know, I don't see how it is relevant. So um, that's um, the difficulty of the detection. And then we can talk about visual versus text. I was giving you a cartoon of a man walking into a bar, and you saw that some of the information came from text and some of the information came from a cartoon. Should we concentrate on jokes that are purely textual? Should we concentrate on jokes that come from cartoons? Should we concentrate on a mixture of them? And again, each come with, comes with its own set of difficulties through the AI proper, if you will. What computers can do in general before we are taking all that input and putting that together um, into generation or understanding of humor so that we can have a computer that is playing a role of um, that friendly agent that can now joke with us. Let's look at a little bit of theory. I think I told you already that humor has some history and the serious um, studies of humor are Mm, go back to the 20th century, but humor in general has been studied for a long time. And we can go to Plato, Aristotle, etc., etc., into um, when we are looking at humor. The first theory that is applicable to computational humor is 1985 script based semantic theory of humor uh, from Victor Raskin that came from Purdue. Thank you, Victor. Um, <laughs> The, the theory says that a text is joke carrying, meaning that somewhere there, there is a joke, and that joke is going to be funny whether you like it or not, if it contains two things. If it has two scripts or situation, if you will, and these situations overlap somewhere in something and oppose at about the same time, but obviously at various places, different places. This is the joke that is analyzed over and over and over throughout the book. And that is probably a joke that I am guessing has been analyzed in each and every humor conference from 1985 and on. Um, so what is going on here? You have a very old joke, and it is questionable whether or not it is even funny anymore. Oh, by the way, when we are talking about computational humor, that relevance factor has to be taken into account. Um, so you have a patient that is walking into a doctor's home and asking whether the doctor is home. So that is the first script that is being activated, the patient script. And the second one is, no, the doctor's young and pretty wife whispered in reply, come right in. So the lover script is activated. You have script overlap in the sense that it's the same person that is walking there and having a conversation with a woman. And the opposition is that one of them is 
that person is playing a role of a patient and the other one is playing a role of the lover and thus you have the opposition. Um, let us take a look at it from the computational humor perspective. So you have two scripts, which means that those two situations have to be described by a, well, by somebody to a computer, so it has to be known. And suppose that we can calculate what the overlap is. Um, that's easy enough. It's the same person that is doing the actions. But what on earth is oppositeness? When is it that they oppose those scripts? How do you know that patient and lover, the actual scripts, result in a position, result in a clash? Oh, it would be nice also if that clash is unexpected. So that punchline has to provide some unexpectedness to the text of the joke. So what do we learn? Lesson number one that we learn from computational humor. We humans are very good at saying, I see a joke, I see two scripts, intuitively I know where the overlap is and intuitively I know where the oppositeness is. Not so easy for a computer. You want to have something that works within a computer, you better come up with a very, very precise formula. What does it mean to oppose? The minute in 81, uh, sorry, 85 was not an issue. We come to 1990s, that becomes extremely important. Second issue that we have. We have several jokes and we want to compare them. Yeah, we are all Purdue, about Purdue. The, the second theory is also from Purdue. Um, how do we compare it? What does it mean for jokes to be similar and according to what resources? So we have general theory of verbal humor, Atarda Ruskin, 1991, and they are adding five additional resources to the script-based semantic theory of humor. Script overlap and oppositeness stay where they are, but we are now trying to see how those scripts work together. So we are adding logical mechanism. We are adding a situation of what the joke is about in general. We are adding a target or who we are going to be making fun of. We are adding narrative strategy and the language. Out of those six resources, target is the only one that is optional. So um, when you see a text and it is missing a target, it can still be a joke. When you see a text that is missing script overlap and oppositeness, it is not a joke. That's from the computational humor perspective, that's from the computer perspective. What can we do now? We can compare those jokes. Um, that's what, joke three, four, and five, all equally funny. Um, and again, you are in the study of humor, you are dealing with the material that is provided. These are not supposed to be offensive, they are old, but we can replace the target with pretty much anything and these jokes are still going to work equally well. And if we are looking at the um, six knowledge resources, then we can compare the jokes. Um, the more the resources you have that vary, the more dissimilar the jokes are. So you have joke number one and joke number three, and the only thing that varies between them is the language resource. So you can see that it doesn't start how many polls does it take, the third one doesn't, but it changes the form, if you will but everything else is the same. Those, thus, these two jokes are very similar. Joke number two and joke number one, however, are changing the situation. One of them is about washing your car. The other one is changing the light bulb. Thus, those two jokes are less similar. And if we are looking at joke number three and joke number two, they have two knowledge resources that um, are not the same, thus on that continuum they're even less similar than joke number one and joke number two. Um, that's the linguistics of humor. Why is that important? Well, A, we can now have experiments that say if we give humans 
however many jokes until they get sick and tired of reading them. And we ask them intuitively, which of them do you think are most similar? And if our prediction, according to the theory, matches what they say, aha, uh -huh, now we understand what's going on in our brain. Sort of, kind of. Um, the theory was actually verified just like that, and the only thing that um, was questionable was the logical mechanism. The logical mechanism did not quite align, but everything else worked like a charm. Thus, we can use this theory, put it into the computer, and do something about it. The third theory that I want to touch on, and that is more on the psychological side of it, is Vich's uh, theory of humor. Um, somewhere in the 2000s, I do believe. And that is a theory that says, thank you, 98. And that is a theory that says when we can find something funny. So um, if something happened to you, never mind, never mind that. Today, you like the joke. Tomorrow, something happens to you. And the joke is about that. If you are strongly affected by that thing that happens to you today, you're not going to find that joke funny. Okay? Again, why do we care about it? Because if a computer is going to joke to us about something, at the very least, it should avoid some major disasters. Just not going to fly. Right? So these are the sort of things that we need to pay attention to. OK, what exists today? The fun stuff, right? I told you we're all about Purdue. Um, light bulb joke generator, again, Atardo and Ruskin, a little bit later than the general theory of verbal humor, um, which was a parody of computational humor. And they say, suppose we have a template. How many x doesn't take to change a light bulb and some number? Then you have number one minus number two and some activity and number two to some other activity. And then you have, let's say, an Excel spreadsheet that lists all of those activities. And you have a very smart computer that takes information from this cell, substitutes it with this right here, this cell with that right there. You, you get the idea, right? Um, and surprise, surprise, it's going to generate this joke computational humor. Is it? Is it, though? I mean, yes, it is a system that produces it. But is it truly computational, and is it something that we want? Let's switch gears a little bit. And this is a really a computational humor system. Um, this is a de generator of riddles. All of these are generated by a computer. They are based roughly on nine patterns, or at least the one that I'm showing you is. There is a series of japes, depending on which one you're looking at, um, different number of templates, sentences, uh, schemata, uh, et cetera, et cetera, are going to be there. But these particular ones, um, jape three, um, had um, these numbers, so nine patterns. And which, what you can see over here is a sentence, how it is phrased. So what do you get when you cross some noun phrase with a noun, another noun phrase? You have a string that results from it somehow, which is going to be produced by that function over here. And what you get is, what do you get when you cross a murderer with breakfast food? A serial killer. That is good. I mean, that is good, right? Uh, it's no worse than what we would find in children's riddles. Um, this system was extended um, to a practical application. Um, it, they did add pictures to it. But it did actually help children with limited abilities of uh, learning language to actually play with it. And the results were fascinated. All of a sudden, those kids that would refuse to talk would start conversations because they could play with the system. And they extend, it, it extended it quite a bit. And again, it was pictures. It was friendly interface. But here is your practical application, a very practical application. 
Uh, next, what exists today? Um, HAHACRANIM, also a series of uh, papers and uh, research that took a long, long time that resulted in multiple papers, um, takes a uh, phrase, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, an acronym, uh, MIT, and generate something like Mythical Institute of Theology, uh, completely humor-free, uh, sorry, theory-free, but does use WordNet, does use antonyms, and comes up with something like that. That is also quite good, right? Association for Computing Machinery, Association for Confusing Machinery, Please also pay attention that those words that they're changing sound very much like the original ones. Fairly impressive, right? Um, I should say that these are the best ones that computer came up with. But still, um, quite good. And then we have a lot of work that is based on templates. It was based on templates when it started in the 90s. It is still based on templates. So here is an example of one of them. The template is I like my X like I like my Y, comma, Z. Um, what you see as an H, I like my men like I like my T, hot and British, is something that humans generated. And those that are Cs is something that computer generated. And you can see evaluation that compared to human judgment. Um, computer was just a touch better, but um, whether it was funny or not, um, it's open to interpretation. Again, why does it, why do we need it? When we are putting it like this on a slide, you know, just this is what a computer did. It's not funny at all. But if you would insert something like that in a conversation, when appropriate, I repeat again, when appropriate, and to whom it is appropriate, then perhaps it would actually work, and perhaps the funniness level would come up a little bit. That was generation. What is happening with detection of humor? We can look at it from two sides. One, as I told you, the essence of humor, right? What does it how can we create a joke that is actually funny using all the theory based that we know? And so far, you heard about three of them. Um, and the other one is corpus-based point of view. So we know that the theories are far from perfect. That's a known fact. Nobody's even arguing with that. Why would we try to use those imperfect theories when we have tons of data that is available freely everywhere? Let's just take it all together and see what kind of patterns we can find. Easy enough, right? Maybe if we do it from both sides, meet in between, we will get something. So here is one that is um, based on a corpus. Actually, three of them that are listed here are based on the corpus. What is happening here? We have a collection of humorous one-liners, and we have a collection of Proverbs, we have a connection of Reuters titles and uh, sentences from British National Corpus. Um, we have machine learning approach, various machine learning approaches that are trying to find patterns and classify things into what is funny and what isn't funny. And um, you can see that the accuracy is quite good. But if you look at the actual features and what these approaches actually take into them, you will see that the first approach came up with something that was um, sort of relevant to what they are doing. So human-centric vocabulary, negation, negative orientation. Uh, probably some professional communities, if we are talking about um, uh, one-liners. The second approach is removing all of it. They are saying, we are going to discard all those features. And we are not actually going to use any of the existing machine learning algorithms that are famous for classifying everything well. We are going to take something that, uh, well, we just feel like taking. And let's see if we can come up with some interesting results. And indeed, they do. 
they do. Um, both results are quite good. What does it tell us? Well, we can classify things. We can take any approach, and with enough corpus, we will be able to come up with a line, with a hyperplane, that will select something that's funny from something that is non-funny. The next question is, what does it, does, does it do for us for our understanding of humor? And according to those two studies, the answer is absolutely nothing. Because if we can classify something well, take those features, completely remove it, and still classify it even better, what does it mean? The features were not good? A machine is smart enough to classify it no matter how much you interfere with it? Um, where's humor in it, other than a simple classification task? Um, but again, would be useful, can be useful, provided that we can iterate and iterate and iterate on the features and provided that we can do a little bit more with humor theories. Um, from the theory-based perspective, and we are back to riddles and children's jokes, which are uh, valued so highly um, by everyone, we are looking at a detection system that will not just detect what is funny and what isn't, but also explain why something is funny. And um, if you look at some of those jokes, and they're taken from real joke books, um, I can repeat that again if you don't think that they're funny, they are taken from real joke books. Um, some of them are quite creative, um, but some of them are, you sort of go, when is it useful? What can I do with it? Is there a lot of humor research here, really? Or am I just playing with some variability on the sounds and then I am done with it? Um, so the answer here is, you can play with the sounds, but if you are starting with a world knowledge that is fairly small, let's say taken from children's dictionary, that is 2,500 words. You insert that all into the computer with all of the anchoring mechanisms that happens there. The joke detection goes, is very, very limited. You increase the knowledge to 5,500. The rate goes up. You increase the knowledge to everything that you need to know in order to understand all of those jokes. Wow, now we have a system that is actually explaining to us what is funny and why it is funny, which is fairly impressive. Well, I wasn't impressed because um, the system also told me what I didn't think was funny that it was and showed me why, and it's a sad day when a system tells you that you are, don't see something that you should. Um, but um, if we are looking at it from a theory adjustment standpoint, what can we do for computational humor? Take a look at this joke. That comes from the same collection, more or less. Um, jokes for children based on a wordplay. So, um, Johnny, you've been working in our garden a lot this summer. Yes, my teacher told me to weed a lot over the vacation. What's going on over here? We go from weed to read. The kid doesn't understand. You have a joke. That is a much better joke. There are actually two. Uh, I, I told you it's not going to be funny. Um, you have two interpretations, right? One is that the teacher told the, the child to work in the garden a lot. The other one, which is rather unusual for a teacher, and the other one that he misunderstood, she actually, or he, told him to read, not weed. In order for a computer to recognize it, you have to have all that knowledge, and then it actually can recognize it if it has all that knowledge. The problem is that the way it's going to look for oppositeness, because it has all that knowledge and all of those connections, it is looking at all of the possibilities. And it takes days to calculate all of those possibilities and comes up, come up with something where the overlap and oppositeness is actually possible. Lesson number two from the theory building, create shortcuts. 
Our minds don't work like, let's look at all of the possibilities. We are actually looking at particular things that are um, relevant to us. So we can say right away, right here, what is going on, where the shortcut is going to be. So perhaps, perhaps, instead of looking at everything in the world of script overlap and oppositeness, we should look at something that goes towards the goal. You have a goal of a script. You're going towards the goal in some path. Look for the oppositeness that matters. Let's look at that. Um, you started reading first and second line. How many of you were able to predict the third one? No? OK, then it's a good joke. And it's fairly unexpected. Um, if you are a computer, student and teacher should have triggered some kind of a response that is similar, that should lead you to that um, punchline, especially when you know that it's going to be something unexpected. And it is rather unexpected for teacher not to um, be upset with a student that doesn't do his or her homework, right? So that adjustment that I'm talking about, how well does it work and where does it work? It works most of the time, about 20% of the time. Where it doesn't work, now that is a real joke. That is actually much better than those that are come from children's dictionary. It is uh, those that instead of um, comparing situations, it's something within the situation that is happening that is funny. So here is um, a uh, aristocratic lady upset that uh, the chauffeur is telling uh, her his first name um, while his last name is Darling. So in the end, she reverts to the first name. We are dissecting the frog. Um, so in these situations, it doesn't work. But again, we can group those theories or those jokes into those various subcategories and then create shortcuts that would be useful for us. Um, I am going to, yeah, why not? Um, back to the generation. Back to the generation when it's a semantic generation. This is a later work, so we are no longer generating templates. Um, we are generating sentences that are based on scripts. And what you see here is why does the priest kneel in church? Because he wants to propose to a woman. Here's one example, and the other one is, why is the computer in the hospital? Because it has a virus. Um, you also see that um, this work was evaluated on 48 jokes, and on the uh, rate from one to four, where one is nonsense and four is hilarious, um, most of these were rated as nonsense, and I mean heavy nonsense. Um, and again, the question is why? These are perfectly well-constructed jokes. It is impressive that a computer constructed those jokes. Why are they not funny? What is wrong with us? Maybe it's a different set, uh, setup. Maybe they weren't evaluated in an environment where uh, we asked, um, think of the children that, children that will generate those jokes. I don't know. Or maybe it's the sentences. Maybe when we are expecting a joke, we don't want to see something in the brackets that says, think of a concept that we are going to activate. So maybe, maybe it's going to be easier for us to switch to cartoons and have exactly the same thing that is happening with those jokes, but play with the cartoons and play with the characters of the cartoons. So tag those things. Tag the people, tag the furniture, tag the actions. Rate them, rate the funniness of them, then throw machine learning, then throw theories, then throw something, and maybe we can come up with something that would actually work and be fairly successful. So if we do that, um, here is an original cartoon, and here is a cartoon that was done when a computer replaced the characters. Um, I don't know if anyone would call it hilarious, 
but at least it makes sense. The substitution makes sense. This cartoon is funnier than this one. Um, this cartoon is definitely less funny than this one right here, right? The next question is, why did the computer make those choices? For example, why was this tree removed? Why was this bone removed from here? What is there, what kind of mechanism is there that makes us remove some of the attributes? But if we ignore that, that's again fairly impressive and this is a um, computer generated humor. Then the question is, why is all of this necessary? I mean, okay, we saw one practical application where it actually helped people. And I am trying to tell you that sometime in the future, it would be nice to have computers that actually understand humor because maybe we will appreciate computers a little bit more or not. But couldn't we just take the jokes, the existing jokes that people write and insert them somewhere? Just, you know, take something that is used already, that works. Don't come up with something that you are creating. Well, it's not as easy as it sounds. So you have a joke over here. And then you have other jokes that are very similar. And you can see that this one is constructed exactly the same way as the first one. And the second one, we are just replacing Jimmy, Joey Jim, or sorry, little old Irishman with Joey Jim, but everything else is about the same, except that it's a little bit more verbose. The question is, when should we insert what? How do we know what people are going to like? Is there something that more people will like? I'm going to skip a couple of those, and I'm going to skip a couple of those also, but you can see that a computer can actually, it is possible to um, map a joke into an ontological structure, that world knowledge, if you have um, enough of it. And then you can actually compare the jokes and then it looks something like that. And on this picture, never mind the jokes, they're all equally bad, um, you can see where the white things are and that means that an attribute is missing from the joke. And those that are colored, that means that all of the versions are there, that attribute is there. And if you compare, and the versions follow similar patterns, so one you remove the dialogue, and then the other one you increase the link, et cetera, et cetera, and then you are looking at the humor subjects and their appreciation. If we, you do it with multiple jokes, many jokes, 10 in this case, um, and all five versions of the jokes, then you can see something like that. And what this tells you if you are somebody who created this experiment, that people don't particularly appreciate jokes when they are short and don't have a dialogue. That's the story. All is good. Um, statistically significant, I mean beautiful. And then you look at the versions. And these are your 10 jokes and these are your appreciations and you can see that for some of them, yes, it does go down. But for some of them, it actually goes up. And you're wondering what is going on. And perhaps, perhaps we shouldn't just look at the style of the joke, but we need to look at what the joke is about, going back to the psychology, and look at the whole picture. Maybe that's what we should be studying when we are looking at computational aspects of it. Why am I telling you this? Um, Bob Mankoff um, talked a little bit about the New Yorker cartoons and the uh, caption contest and how they tried to detect which of the jokes are funnier, which of the captions are funnier, and they're running into exactly the same thing. We don't have a universal uh, agreement of what is funny and what isn't. And you can look at something like that and it does give you some information. But when you are talking about an individual person, if you are going to bring it to an individual as opposed to looking at the populace at large, you will have to look a little bit further into all of those differences. 
Now, um, remember I told you that we can go from a autonomous humor generation into a fairly uh, human-based uh, generation or detection of humor. And the question is, should we do everything? Or is it OK for a human to do all the work? Here is a work that was produced for a um, conversation, a um, conversation between people uh, on a chat um, of some sort. And uh, what they wanted to do was, if a computer suggests a lot of images that can be inserted for a particular theme, um, so if I am saying, why are you late? What if I insert an image? And computer suggests you, let's say, six images, and then a human selects those six images. So the legwork is done by the computer. The human just has to click. Um, would that interface be friendlier or not? The answer is yes, it would be, and it would be significantly. It would be significantly friendlier if there is no um, images. There would be significantly friendlier if it's the computer that detects the image, any one of those six, and inserts it, because then there is no quality control. So there is combination between human and computer that actually works fairly well. Um, and this is the final slide. And this is where I was going when I said, when we talk online, we are communicating on Twitter, when we are communicating on Facebook, we are communicating on a lot of things. Um, we are being mined quite a bit. Wouldn't it be nice if computer actually detected when we are serious and when we are not? Um, it would be for two reasons. One, then it shouldn't take information into this whole category of this is what I know about you when you are not serious. But the second one, if you are looking at this communication, what is going on here is that the second person is making a joke which is open to interpretations. This particular one was based on the fact, those of you that remember BlackBerry, um, the conversation is taken in 2012, that BlackBerry is old. It's a really old device. Why are you doing it? But the way the second person interpreted was that it's not that the device is old, obsolete, no longer works, but that the stock of the company goes down. So what this person wanted to see um, shifted the perception significantly. And for that person to recover, they have to see that interpretation. So if for some reason there is a misunderstanding and a computer that understands everything, that sees all of the possibilities because it has all that knowledge, then perhaps it would be able to suggest that interpretation, which would result in considerably fewer um, misunderstanding. So what can we learn from humor right now? That it is very complex. But we can also learn that we can do some theory adjustments that will reflect how we process it, how we humans actually operate. Thank you very much. Um, if there are any questions, I'll take them, but uh, I think because we are taping it, um, you have to come to the microphone, maybe. Thank you. How, how did we, how was Watson incentivized to want to increase its knowledge? And how can we in, then incentivize or provide incentives for a computer to want to be funny? Um, I am not sure that Watson ever wanted to do anything. It's the developers behind it 
that wanted for it to increase its knowledge. And then it gave, they gave it whatever materials they wanted to give it. And it learned from that. Um, how would we want, when a computer would decide that it wants to be funny? Uh, again, I am not sure that it does that. Um, we do have, if you are working with multiple interpretations every once in a while, computer does joke. It is terrifying, but it does. Um, most of the time, it is completely unintentional. The good jokes that come out of it are unintentional. But we see double interpretation, and for us, it is funny. Until you click a button of some sort that says, it is allowed to look for certain patterns and see how a human responds to it. And maybe there is some kind of a box that says, yes, I liked it. Right? So there is this uh, loop of feedback that is going on. I am not sure that uh, a computer will decide anything of that sort. But again, with proper feedback, it's possible. So this might cross more into the psychology of the humor, but um, in sort of the, the corpus-based approach you're talking about, um, has anyone done like any good studies on like how children evolve humor over time? Because it definitely seems that there are stages that, that younger children from say like preschool on up through the you know, college years, as they go through, there's a progression of their humor and how they generate humor and how they respond to it. Um, there are some studies, yes, absolutely. Um, and they go back to the 70s, I believe, the 50s, thank you. Um, the problem with, the difficulty with doing it is that uh, if you are a psychologist, you probably know, children are not going to evolve, you know, at four, you learn this. So you have this range that is difficult to assess when you are doing it, when you are reporting an experiment. It's not going to be a discrete interval of time, but there are certainly studies that are looking at various um, evolution of humor, if you will. Hello, Professor. Um, many AI enthusiasts want to, they want to make an AI as human as possible. And uh, humor plays a lot, a big role in being human. Uh, we are human because, not only because we can think and take, make decisions, we are also human because we can laugh at jokes and make jokes. Mm -hmm. And if there's no general algorithm or any method to generate a general joke, um, making an AI as human as possible is going to be a bit difficult. So how, how necessary do you think uh, humor generation is for AI? Um, you can always cheat. You can always have a joke that is there. And if you recognize that it would be appropriate, you can take that joke and put it, uh, a ready generated joke, into the mix, right? Um, how necessary is humor in general? Um, it depends. Um, if we want a machine to be as similar to a human as possible, then yes, it is probably necessary. The question is, do we want to? Um, there is a different question also. Um, if we are saying that a machine should be similar to a human, most of us, when we generate jokes, they're very poor jokes. Are we willing to allow a machine to generate those jokes that are of a poor quality, saying it's OK because we do similar things? Or do we want a machine to be perfect when it comes to a sense of humor? And if we want it to be perfect, how similar is it to us? So you see, there are a lot of questions that one would think about when you're making that choice of whether humor is necessary. We have just one more minute, so. Uh, hi. Um, so most of the the jokes and the theories we're talking about come to it from the intellectual point of view of humor, um, but some comedians, etc., 
uh, are funny just in the way they say something. Like one person can say not funny, another person hilarious. Yep. Some comedians, their facial expressions alone. Are there any studies that yep. so look at that? Yes, um, there are quite a few studies within humor community that study comedians. Um, the reason why I did not bring them up, and, and they are sessions on what comedians actually do and what they say, and when you study various performances at humor conferences, the reason why I did not bring it up is at the level where computational humor is right now, that knowledge is practically impossible to put in a system. But yes, most definitely, it depends on various things. It depends on the audience. It depends on the size of the audience. It depends on a great many things, what, what a human would actually do. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Thank you very much.